Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. The institutional investors need to look in the mirror and ask themselves a couple questions. I mean, if you're a huge firm, you know, what's your priority? Your priority is to the shareholders and the investors and the owners. It's not with the investor. It's not with the, the, use, the person who's using your expertise. It's the investor that invested in the firm that they're, they care about. They don't care about the guy who's buying their product. If I'm on the other end of that equation, that bothers me. Now, Don is known as a pure trend follower, so to speak. But in your opinion, you know, is there a limit at some point as to how much juice, in lack of a better word, that you can squeeze out of, of the market as a trend follower? And do you need to look at other things in order to keep up with the kind of the, the quant mega shops that seems to be doing everything from high frequency to, you know, uh, machine learning? I mean, what, 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 do you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, so we do look at basically anything that comes across our plate. I mean, we've looked at machine learning. We've looked at short-term trading i i've been interested in the short-term space for years yeah. and you know we we keep looking we keep trying you know i talk about the adaptive nature of our parameters well the parameters never choose the short term right. just never does it, it it's just not profitable for any period of time that you know there are a couple of shops out there that are doing something in the short-term space that have done well and consistently well, probably one or two of them. But most people, they can make money for a little while and then it just kind of evaporates and the system just doesn't work anymore. And, you know, they're they're around for five to ten years and then they disappear. I, I really feel if you can, you know, the one missing piece in our program is short term time frame if i could find something that worked in the short term time frame as a trend following component i would love to to add it to the program in some way we are trading volatility now right. which is new for us and we're we started trading vix several years ago in the wma program as a relative value trade not trend following but very simplistic. Uh, we're basically short fix most of the time. But we hired, you know, we bought a, a firm that had a, a volatility trading system. We hired that gentleman to join Dunn. And I had been looking for years and years at volatility and trying to find people that were trading volatility. My concern was that most aspects are just you know, the short side of the volatility trade, which everybody made money over the last five years on the short side of volatility. I didn't want to have, I mean, we could do that. I wanted somebody that was doing something different in volatility, but making money. And what I found, what we're doing now, and we're starting to implement this into the WMA, so this will replace our current volatility program, is we're trading volatility of volatility. So we're trading the skew or the or the you know, the, the fear change of, fear, yeah. of the curve in volatility, and with the idea that when volatility does spike, 
that should be a positive for us. And yet we're still making money on the short side of the volatility trade. So you'll hear more about that. The machine learning things, it's a very capital intensive business. It's hard to compete with the big guys. Same with high frequency trading, almost impossible. I mean, we can't compete with the big guys in, in that type of environment. But yeah, there's there's other things that we're looking at and we're exploring. We just, you know, we were one of the first people that traded a neural net, net program right. years ago. And it worked pretty well. What we found was you have to retrain the brain on a regular basis. And the gentleman that had developed the system for us, sadly, he passed away. And, you know, there was some expertise that was required to run that, re do the retraining process. And we didn't have that expertise. So it, the, we closed the system down, haven't traded it since. So going on the same vein here, you're talking about VIX, you're talking about VOL. Uh, what are some of the, what's your view on markets? I know that's been sort of the biggest buzzword, kind of, I have 300 markets or I trade. <laughs> you know, how many markets do you have? Um, <laughs> what's your view about the expansion of, into more and more markets and, and how do, does Dunn think about this problem? All right, so Dunn allocates all its risk equally to each market. We don't borrow, so we allocate the maximum risk allowable to each market equally. And then we don't borrow risk from one market and give it to another or anything like that. So from our perspective, adding a market, all it does is change your mis mix of markets. So if, if you thought sectors were important, which I don't, but a lot of people in the industry do. So you add all the currency pairs and you add you know, anything and everything. All what you're doing is changing the mix of your portfolio and are those markets giving you any value? So we only add a market that we feel gives us a value from a correlation standpoint. If there's a market that's trading that's on a regulated exchange and has enough volume that it is easily traded, if it's uncorrelated to the other markets in our portfolio, and we don't look at just the markets in the sector, we look at all the markets, then it's it's an advantage for us to add that to the portfolio. Now, we're not going to add markets just for the sake of adding them. I, and I think a lot of people that trade a lot of markets, it's purely an AUM issue because they can raise capacity if they can spread the trades over more and more markets. I don't know how they can trade 300 markets. I, I've seen out there, I, I don't even see how people trade 100 markets. Uh, we trade 54, we're looking at, you know, going to 57, maybe 58. So but no Bitcoin? I'm just no. kidding. <laughs> that was no. just a joke. Sorry. And, and, you know, it's funny you say that because, I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to trading it, but I'm not going to trade it right now. <laughs> right. Right. I, I never say never. Okay. But, uh, yeah. I'll, qu I'll quote but, you on uh, that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't see. First off, there's not a real market there. The mar the margin requirements are absolutely ridiculous. I think you have to be like three times the notional level of the of the currency you're trading. I mean, why would you want to do that? Yeah. What are you going to do? Borrow money to trade it? So, I mean, our leverage is, you know, we don't we aren't paying interest. <laughs> We're receiving interest on our leverage. So, it's one of the nice things about the industry we're in. Yeah, I just want to jump around a little bit and, and sort of ask in, in, in different aspects, maybe something that you might not be asked uh, that many times, and that is when you think about the business side of things, there is definitely a tendency that some of the people in this space are becoming very institutionalized. They're either being bought by bigger institutions or part-owned by bigger institutions. Well, they're publicly traded, some of them, right? I mean, they are they, they yeah, actually they, present yeah, public right. financials. So what do you think is sort of the advantage, disadvantage of being your own privately owned company where you know you decide versus you know having access to to these larger institutions and the resources that they may ha may have? Have you ever thought about that? So, because clearly the institutional investors, they find kind of comfort. Let's face it, they find comfort in 
the big number, right? The, the 50 PhDs, the 200 people, et cetera, et cetera. But I just wanted to hear your uh, sort of view on, on that institutionalization, even on the manager side. Yeah, well, clearly smaller gives you more flexibility. But I, I think the other thing is, you know, the institutional investors need to look in the mirror and ask themselves a couple questions. I mean, if you're a huge firm, you know, what's your priority? Your priority is to the shareholders and the investors and the owners. It's not with the investor. It's not with the the use the person who's using your expertise. It's the investor that invested in the firm that they're they care about. They don't care about the guy who's buying their product. If I'm on the other end of that equation, that bothers me. Yeah. You know, the big houses make more money off the management fee than they ever will off the incentive fee. They know that. Yeah. And that's, their overhead is huge. They've got to have that consistent flow of capital. Now, the reality is, is that true? Probably not. I mean, if the owners of that firm took all the money they've made over the years and kept that available to put back into the firm during bad years, they could easily do it. I mean, that's what Bill's philosophy. I mean, think about it. Dunn went for five years without collecting fees. Yeah. Who paid the bills? Right. Bill Dunn did. <laughs> you know, and he didn't have to do that, sure. but he thought that was you know, the proper thing to do. And also with the idea of long term, he's reaping the benefits of that today mm. because 20% of the AUM we manage it is our own proprietary AUM. And who do you think most of that money, the proprietary money, is bills? So the growth of his capital far outweighs the fees that he's made over the years. It's phenomenal because, you know, you've seen our returns. And, you know, my feeling is we should be able to double people's money every five years. I mean, that's the goal. Well, if you take the incentive fee out of that, because we don't charge ourselves a fee, think about that growth. Yeah. It's compounded. Compounding is a wonderful thing. And, uh, One you of know, the eight wonders of the world, as Warren Buffett says. It, it's absolutely true. And, you know, all our employees, I would say most of them invest the lion's share of their investable assets with Dunn. Why wouldn't they? makes perfect sense. Given that, what are some of the things that you think are important to adapt to the changes in this environment? I know you've moved into the 40X space over the last few years. Some of the, What are some of the things that, as a smaller manager that's more of your own business, what are the, some of the things you're doing to adapt to this? What do you see are the changes that are going to be necessary to be made going forward? Well, so the 40 Act has been a huge deal for us. Uh, the USIT fund in Europe has been a huge deal for us. They've both done probably better than I would have expected, uh, given, especially given the tough environment. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I would like to have more control over things you know when you when you partner with people you tend to you know you basically are giving up control of that aspect of the business i mean all that i do is trade which actually i prefer i don't have to worry about all the other things but i'd like to have a little more control over how it operates because my name's attached to it so it's our reputation and you know the 40 Act and the Usits and those products, they all have a management fee. They all There's expenses that have to be paid that as much as I find it distasteful, you know, there's no way around it. And the one thing I am really happy with is the people we found the partnership with in those spaces because we have been offered many times to trade for for people in, in each of those spaces over the years, but they were never what I considered or Bill considered to be client-centric type vehicles. 
And, you know, the people we did end up partnering with, they really do uh, do it the right way. I mean, they, they keep the cost to a minimum for the investor. So you'd say some of the ad- adapting is really learning how to find the right uh, ways to partner with others. Yeah, it's, and, it's finding the right and, partners. And develop the right products. And if I was a bigger firm and had AUM, I mean, we'd go out and do our own. But we don't have that ability. Uh, you know, capability. So you have to find the right people to partner with. And it, it took a lot of years and, you know, luckily we didn't have any false steps, which, which damaged our reputation. But you think about it, it's taken 40 plus years to develop the reputation that Dunn has. You know, and it's, it's, it's on my watch now to make sure that reputation stays positive. Uh, that's a lot of responsibility because it takes five to ten minutes to destroy the reputation. Yeah. You you talked about the sort of the educational side and and the focus that we have on education. What what do you find that investors have the hardest thing? Well, what's the hardest thing for them to understand? about what we do and 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 where where do we need to not just as a firm but maybe as an industry yeah. where do we need to focus that uh, it's everything you know? right i mean the bottom line is what we do is is not like anything they've ever been exposed to in their lives um, the lumpiness of our returns mm-hmm. you know uh, it's the only it's the only investment i would say in most people's portfolio that has this you know, you can't time trend falling. The reason is because when it happens, the trends come in. If you wait until you see the trend, you're too late to the game and you've missed the opportunity. So you have to be there during thick and thin, during the good times and bad times to take advantage of those good times. Evidence has shown us historically that trend followers or at least done, has always gotten to new highs, always gotten to new highs. There's never been a point of time where we've just started going down and continue to go down. There's always a new high water mark. So if you stay the course, you're going to participate in those new high water marks. And the fact that we traded a higher volatility gives people the opportunity not only to perform as well as equities but even better than equities over the period of time but it also allows people to allocate less money to get the same bang for their buck because you know if you're trading at a very low volatility you have to allocate such a large portion of your nab to get the value of the uncorrelated nature of our strategy the fact that we have a higher volatility allows you to allocate less we always talk to people about allocating a percentage of their risk, not a percentage of their AUM. And we advocate 20 to 25% of their overall risk, um, which in most cases is less than 20 or 25% of their AUM, right. which is people like to hear that. The problem is people that allocate too little, they get involved in the strategy, but when they need it the most, it doesn't provide them any benefit because they don't have enough you know, risk allocated to that type of strategy. And the other thing that's interesting, I think, is that a lot of investors, and they don't realize that this goes with equity investments as, as much as it does with, with these type of investments, and that is, and I think this was from a book that I read about from, from Tony Robbins, actually, where he had gone back and, and looked at, if you had been invested in equities for the last 20 years, your average return was something like, you know, 8%. But if you took out the best 10 days only, of those 20 years, it almost halves. Yeah. And it's the same thing with trend following. I mean, if you take a long-term trend following track record over many years, if you take out the best 10 months, I'm sure you're going to see somewhat similar picture in terms of yeah. your, 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 the outcome. And I, I, think, I think that also, that's something that people find hard to understand, that the benefit for them is to make an investment and then don't think about it for the next 10, 20, 30 years. I mean, that that mindset, because in today's world with the internet, everything it is instant. The, the whole 
time horizon in our life has become very short. And and with the public, with investments in general, whether it's quarterly reporting, there's monthly reporting, people even look at daily returns and get excited about it, but it's not very important in the bigger picture. Yeah. So I think that's another, I mean, that for, I don't know about you, Katie, you've been around for a long time. What are, what are, what are the challenges you see? Well, I think, you know, trend flying works when things happen. And these are usually things that we don't expect. And it's more interesting when things happen we don't expect whatsoever. So, I mean, oil going to a different level than we would have ever expected. Um, stock markets losing as much as they did in 08. It's precisely these really challenging unexpected environments that trend really catches something, some inefficiencies, some movement in the markets. And if you think you're going to determine when those are, I mean, people tell me that all the time, and I'm sure Marty's heard it a thousand times or maybe a million. If you try and time when things are going to happen that you don't expect, you're gonna, it's going to be challenging for you. Well, if people expected it, it wouldn't happen. Exactly. Because they would have been prepared for it, and there would have been a very gradual change. But they call it unexpected for a reason. I mean, if, you know, from 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 your the co-author of of your own book. I mean, with with Alex. I mean, knowing what you don't know is is really really important as an investor, and accepting that you just don't know what the future holds. So, so my goal is over the next ten years is to get people to understand that trend following should be the core mm-hmm. investment in their portfolio, and then they can use everything else to build around it. Yeah. Boy, is that a concept? Yeah. That's a goal. That's <laughs> there a, probably are many people that look at it that way, but that's sure. the way I view it. Yeah. I mean, why not invest in everything? I mean, every yeah. asset class and every move. I mean, there's no reason not to catch, you know, capture multiple risk premia instead of just one or two. Right. But and is diverse and you know, the the number of uncorrelated markets that are traded within a systematic trend following strategy mm. is so much farther advanced than you know, ninety percent of the other financial products out there. Yeah. Well, yeah. Add liquidity, add tra- let transparency. I mean, there's a lot of there's a there's lot of a good lot things. Of there's a lot of positive. There. Yet, if yet people have you know, certainly it's been a challenge. For I a know lot what of I want to ask. It. Yeah, actually, I want to. And this is maybe me being a little risk averse here, but you know, what are the things you're afraid of? I mean, it's always fun for me to hear what. You know, what is would you think is a black swan or a tail risk? Something that we would worry about in our industry. Regulation. What keeps you up at night? Okay. Regulation. <laughs> the regulator. I mean, I, when I first basically took over the day-to-day operations of Dunn, we basically allocated one person maybe eight to ten hours a month to compliance. I now have Two people work at full time at compliance, and another one that's part time at compliance. You know, it's it's absolutely ridiculous the amount of compliance that we're put through. And I would say it has absolutely no value. It has no value to the industry. It has no value to the public. It's just a way for government people to say they're doing something, and it's not going to stop the bad actors. You know, the bad actors will still commit fraud. Because they're not going to fill out the paperwork honestly. They're not going to report things honestly. But I wish they would spend more time responding to complaints and less time doing what I consider busy work. I think on top of that, also, I mean, we 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 come across that in our in 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 our work day to day. In part of our education, even in a conversation like this, we have to be very careful not to overstate the benefits. We have to always say this is a risky investment, and you can lose a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera, which is true. But at the same time, you see other people selling other investment related products, financial newsletters, using headlines of you know, make X thousand percent on Bitcoin (laughs) and what have you, and they kind of get away with these things. So, I mean, so in a sense, regulation can be damaging for the industry in many ways. It can also be damaging for our ability to educate if we're so restricted as to what we're allowed to say. So it it, it goes on many different fronts. But, you know, it's interesting, and we, we obviously have to adapt to how it has to be done and and um, and stay away from those areas. Yeah, but, wouldn't it be a nicer environment if if you were allowed to basically say what you think is honestly yeah. true and then the regulator's job would be to come in and say 
Do you have proof? You for that? said that yeah. you could do this, and you didn't do it. So, you know, you then have you done have a to bad thing. Yourself. Yeah, yeah then, absolutely. Then you should be sure. You know, if you put outlandish guarantees out there and you don't perform, then you should be punished for that. But even talking about what you've actually delivered, that that you have the proof for, you're not allowed to. You no, you know. So it's a, well, you can do it. You just have to point out every negative thing that's ever happened. Right. So. Fair and balance, is that what they call it? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. What, what in, in sort of, we're early 2018 as we're talking, what do you think the most important question investors should be asking themselves right now as we go into this, this new year, so to speak? Um, they should take a look at their portfolio and see if it's out of whack. Mm-hmm. I, I suspect that, most people are very, very overweighted equities, right. not only because of performance, but because they've they've actually are starting to chase the tail of the dog, mm-hmm. you know, getting out of the poor performers and putting more money in play at equity levels. And the reality is they should be doing exactly the opposite, not saying that this is the year that you're going to see something bad happen in equities, because to tell you the truth, I don't. You know, I'm not one of these people that thinks everything's so overvalued. I, 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 when I look at the political environment and I look at the tax environment and I look at, you know, the deregulation and, and things of that nature, it makes sense to me that equities are going up. Of course, I don't rely on my opinion because I'm wrong more often than I'm right. But, you know, it's like anything else. I mean, these markets will these equity markets will break. And the longer it runs, it means the the more damage that's going to be done on the other end. And there's going to be a lot of people that are going to say, oh, how could this happen? And Yet a lot of what's happening is that investors are being pushed into more risky investments. Oh, well, sure. Yeah, I mean, which is the tragedy of, of, of this, when it if and when it happens, I guess. I mean, you know, the idea that you can get better dividend returns than you can in bond markets. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it forces people to make hard decisions, and whether they understand the risk or not, you know, this is where they need to be to get the returns that they were hoping to get. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the managed futures industry hasn't helped itself because it's struggled over this period of time, too. It seems like the only game in town has been equities. Um, And Bitcoin. (laughs) Yeah, well. (laughs) Well, I mean, what what about you, Katie? What What do you think? We're heading into 2018. I mean... I think, you know, when everybody thinks that something's going to happen, that's when I get nervous because I think if they think that something's going to happen, then it never does. Mm-hmm. Usually when we become complacent mm. and we say, well, it's not going to happen now. It'll mm-hmm. be fine. Yeah. That's when something happens. And the problem is, you know, things can change on a dime and underlying systemic risk can be there that we didn't understand until after the fact. So from my perspective, having trend falling is really a way of, not hedging, but having a strategy in your portfolio that likes divergence, that mm-hmm. likes change, that is meant to adapt to a new environment. Right. And, you know, it's it's funny because we're all coming at it from a perspective of data. 90% of the investors don't understand. To, to everybody at this table, this makes such perfect sense because all the data shows it's true but people don't understand data and uh that's okay we just keep educating we keep doing things like this people keep listening you know the message is getting out there i mean look at the growth in the industry i mean look at the growth for done yeah i mean i haven't looked at the numbers but i mean our aum has gone up significantly over the last five years. I mean, RAUM has consistently gone up year after year after year, and it's not just growth of capital. It's new people too, it's isn't new it? People, new investors? New inflows, new types of people. And, and that's exciting. And adding to that, and you know, is that frankly, we're not the ones who grow from 
a large ticket from a pension fund. So, so it's actually many people joining in, which is obviously a, a good thing because it means, as you say, that the message or the audience is becoming... Yeah. I mean, now that we have daily liquidity products, we are seeing on average $200,000 every day of new money flowing into Dunn. That's net new money. And then that excludes the big tickets that that come to the door. But th that's just average people that are putting money in the program. And, and, my, and I've said this in the past, but it really bothers me that strategies like this are not available to mom and pop in the average public. I mean, the fact that you got to have a lot of money, you have to be an accredited investor to have access to this type of strategy is mind-boggling to me. I mean, you hit it on it earlier, transparency, liquidity. I mean, this is a product that was made for the mutual fund market. Everything we hold can be traded in 24 hours. We could liquidate the whole portfolio in 24 hours. There's nothing that we're doing that isn't being done on a regulated exchange. There's no over-the-counter transactions. There's no private equity. There's no real estate. I mean, there's ETFs out there today that are invested in real estate. Who's valuing that on a daily basis? Give me a break. I mean, <laughs> good luck liquidating that portfolio. No, I mean, it is great that, that, that so many more people are able to... Uh, Participate, and as you said, we've certainly seen uh, seen that as have our as have our peers. I mean, that's the good thing. I mean, the mutual fund space, even though there still may be things that you would like to see improve about it, so that people could get even cheaper, uh, you know, access. Mm -hmm. But but um, but there's been a big growth in that area, as in Europe, there's been a big growth in the usage space, which again makes it easier for people to participate. You know, maybe the re regulators over time will start accepting this type of strategy as, as not being scary to them and, and see the advantage of it and start allowing for further investment. For instance, uh, allowing in the 40X space to invest directly in the softs and some of the commodity products that you can't get access to today without going through a swap. Which only adds more cost and it, complexity. Uh, it adds yeah. more cost and, you know, and people write yeah. negative things about, you know, swaps are scary and all that. But, but people have to understand the only reason that we do these things is to get access to markets that aren't available under a normal routine. And you want to have access to that diverse markets. It gives you more opportunity to make money. And, and actually programs with swaps are better for the investor than the programs without swaps. For investors who have only stocks and bonds, you want to be able to give them access to everything they don't have. A absolutely. And, you know, the restrictive nature now is you can only directly invest in financial futures, which is equities and bonds and currencies which they already have exposure to. So, Marty, one final thought. If you had something to impart on a rising star or an investor in our space, what would you have to say about the managed futures industry? I guess I'm excited because I'm excited that it seems like we're kind of hitting our stride. We're just kind of getting to that point where it's accepted more and more people seem to be excited about the space. And when you give in how much of a struggle it's been over the last several years, that's kind of amazing because this would be the point in time normally when everybody says managed futures is dead, trend falling is dead, it'll never happen again. And yet that's not the conversation we're having. So I'm really excited about the fact that we seem to have that, that little bit of foothold and we're starting to move forward. And the onus is on us as an industry to keep that going through the education and keep keep preaching the message. I think the other thing that is troublesome is it seems like all the money's going to the big people. And I really wish the second tier and maybe even the third tier managers could there could be a way for them to get capital to invest, that people will give them the opportunity to trade for them. And I and I don't know how that's gonna work. You know, I, I look at these smaller managers as an opportunity to find talent, but it's becoming harder and harder. And most of these guys, 
you, the, the truth is they're not going to survive because the big allocators are going to continue going to the big houses and they're going to, you know, I'm going to see as a second tier manager having AUM of less than $2 billion, you know, I'm going to start seeing inflows because the performance attracts attention and we're big enough that people are comfortable to allocate. But the people that are below us, it's going to be a real struggle for them. And, you know, I just hope something happens industry-wide that allows them to have more access to capital. It just came to me what my second point was related to earlier in the broadcast, and that was retail investors and RIAs, you know, related to the 40 Act. The other thing is volatility they don't understand. And I kind of approached this earlier in, or later in our conversation, actually. But the fact that it's always been thought of as volatility is a bad thing. The higher volatility, the more risk, the more concern people had. But we're slowly getting the message out there that the higher volatility that's offered by Dunn allows them to allocate less money to get the same bang for their buck. And therefore, it helps their portfolio. By by allocating to something with a high volatility like we are, it lowers their overall volatility in their portfolio because of the no correlation aspect. So they can allocate a third of the amount of money that they might have to allocate to somebody else who trades at a low volatility. And that's one of the misconceptions that people have had in it, it hasn't been very difficult for them to get to understand that. And when they do, it's like the light bulb goes off and they instantly think, if I'm going to allocate to this space, I want to allocate to you because it's more cost effective. Mm. Great. Great. Well, on that note, let's wrap up this fascinating conversation recorded live here in Miami. Marty, thank you so much for being on the podcast and for sharing your thoughts and experiences with Katie and me. It is so important to have practitioners like you share these ideas because when ideas become conversations they that lead to action, that's when real change happens. And to our listeners around the world, let me finish by saying that I hope you got a lot of value from today's conversation. And if you enjoyed this as much as Katie and I did in making it, I hope that you will share these episodes with your friends and colleagues and so that the conversation can continue. From me, Niels Kostroblasen and Katie Kaminsky, thanks for listening, and we look forward to being back with you on the next episode of Top Traders Unplugged. And in the meantime, go check out all the amazing free resources that you can find on the website. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.